behavioral health, but before that, we've got some housekeeping things that we need to talk about. Uh, in the event of an emergency, you better do, we'll turn it over to Dr. Griffin. Following on after a holiday for a lot of folks. Um, so my name's uh, Alexandra Whitmire, um, also go by Sandra, and I'm with the Behavioral Health and Performance Element in the Human Research Program. Um, this might, uh, just out of curiosity, and we're kind of a small group, I was curious, would folks mind sharing just their name real quick and what, what area they're with, and that'll just help me kind of understand who all is here. Would that be okay? No problem. Betty Paul. We've been emailed. Gotcha. Okay. 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 Oh, cool. Okay. Very good. Andy Carnell. Great. Thank you all for doing that. I really appreciate it. It helps me to know who all is here and the diverse areas that you guys are all representing. So um, I will get started and um, essentially just have to throw out there the uh, standard kind of purpose of what the behavioral health or what our group does. And um, we there is a BHP operation side that uh, works with the crews and supports ISS missions. And we represent, I come from the research side of BHP. And so our purpose is to um, develop ways to mitigate and manage um, behavioral health and performance risks, uh, primarily for exploration. And so we focus on understanding ways through which to predict and prevent, monitor and treat um, adverse behavioral outcomes. So like I mentioned before, our group, uh, there's two primary sides to it. Um, folks may recognize some of the names that under the ISS medical operations side, especially those in the clerkship, I would imagine, have heard maybe from Dr. Gary Bevan, and other folks that work with Dr. Bevan include um, Dr. Holland, Dr. Mumal, and Dr. Picano. On the HRP side, um, I support Dr. Lauren Levitin, um, our element scientist, and then Dr. Um, and then Ms. Laura Bullweg, who's our element manager. And uh, last, last little organizational thing, um, just to point, I just wanted to point out that in our group, um, we are divided into three risks, which I'll just show you momentarily. Um, we also have, so we have representatives on the science side and on the management side. And um, we are also uh, starting today, we have a uh, lab manager coming on, a senior scientist, Dr. Tom Williams, um, and he will be developing the part of BHP where we actually have opportunities for folks to uh, actually conduct research. Because what I'm gonna talk to you about is a lot of the work that our external researchers do, but our role in the BHP research element is to be that bridge between what the scientific community is saying and doing and what is needed in operations. So uh, Dr. Williams, who's starting today, he will um, hopefully build up a, a laboratory um, to enable our group to um, also implement um, more directly some research studies. So on the research element side, um, what we consider is given where we are now, our little earth graphic there, what are our primary risks? Um, what are the gaps in knowledge and technology to get us to where we need to go um, for a Mars mission? So we'll look at that in just a moment. And the three primary areas that we focus on, I'm gonna be using these words, BMED, team, and sleep. Those are our three human health risks. BMED and TEAM are considered red or unacceptable for a Mars mission. There's just a lot that we don't know and a lot of work that we need to do. Whereas on the sleep side, even though um, there are still sleep and circadian issues on orbit, um, we have a little bit more understanding, we believe, of what the issues are and we have some mitigations that are going to, um, that are in place and that are gonna uh, continue to be put in place. So 
Um, so sleep is considered, um, even though there's still work to do, it's less in that red um, category by the Human Research Program. So um, our beautiful International Space Station, uh, low Earth orbit missions, which um, are just fantastic and amazing feats. And um, because of the proximity to the station to Earth, um, the Behavioral Health and Performance Operations Group, uh, which I mentioned Gary Bevan to you, they work with the crew members um, prior to flight and during mission and supporting their families in order to provide them things like fresh fruit, um, recreational activities. We also know um, a great mitigation, um, well, mitigation, a great pastime for the crews and something that uh, really helps them feel connected to home is uh, earth viewing and earth photography. And so these are all uh, wonderful um, services that a lot of people work very, very hard to provide and that we know the crew members greatly appreciate. Um, but they are also uh, really facilitated by the, the distance of the ISS and the fact that we can send resupply packages and, and, um, and also um, have the support of mission controllers uh, in real time. And um, the close proximity of the station also allows us to have not just the real-time communication with mission controllers, but the crew members can contact their families. Some of them are able to use FaceTime. Um, and yes, there are times where, um, and I'm sure some of you know, many of you know this better than I do and understand the dynamics behind it, but where we lose communication um, throughout the day. But for the most part, uh, crews are able to stay um, connected uh, with their loved ones back home. And that's certainly not to minimize um, what they're doing now, but we seem to be um, handling and supporting the crews well in this scenario and in this um, kind of paradigm of, of spaceflight missions. So our group on the research side um, considers the Mars aspect. So how are we going to continue to provide this level of care to the crews when they're so much further from home and they're gone for so much longer we don't have real-time communication and we don't have the ability to send uh, as many crew care packages um, and they don't have uh, quick access to looking out the window and seeing Earth and being able to wait till they um, you know, see places on Earth that they connect to. Um, so we're trying to bridge again that, that gap between um, what's being done now and being done very well and um, how we're going to be able to enable this uh, in future missions. So we know that the future exploration missions are going to place um, small teams of individuals into um, this isolated, confined, and extreme environment of Mars. And a crew of, uh, or crews of four to six will be living um, and working in a confined um, spacecraft or habitat. Of course, there'll probably be opportunities for um, rover expeditions and so forth, but um, the unprecedented distance and duration, um, again, with the absence of real-time calm and support from the ground is, is really expected to take a toll. So that's what we're focused on um, in, uh, supporting down the road. So some characteristics looking at the Mars, the design reference mission 5.0, what we've cooled from there, um, the total, the expected total mission duration there is 30 months with six months in transit um, to and from and an expected 18 months at the target. Crew size of six, we see four to six at different times. Uh, composition discussions we hear or we, we've seen noted here probably include a pilot, a physician, then folks, uh, engineers, and uh, with different scientific, scientific backgrounds as well. Um, a variable sex mix, so mix either um, uh, male and female, but if, you know, if there's one uh, predominant over another, we're not sure. Cultural mix, um, assuming that this is a uh, international endeavor. Um, the mission tempo is expected to include long periods of low mission tempo, which is very different than than current operations, interspersed with high activity times. The calm delays up to, up to 22 minutes, um, one way and then back, with occasional blackout, blackout periods. And then the uh, autonomy from ground support um, increasing in route to Mars and then decreasing um, return to Earth. So that's kind of the framework that when we look at the research tasks um, and the research that needs to get done related to behavioral health and performance, we consider these characteristics and um, how critical they will be for us to, to accurately deliver what we need to deliver to enable the future missions. 
So again, um, big differences between um, our current ISS ops and our future exploration missions. And so I'm going to talk about some of these a little bit more specifically. So how many folks have seen The Martian or read The Martian? Okay, excellent. Okay, very good. So um, no spoilers, but I've got a few pictures in, in here uh, from that movie. Um, pretty amazing how they uh, captured the Mars terrain. And here's an actual picture from one of the rovers of Mars that was sent down last year, which is breathtaking that we can actually see Mars to this level of detail. I mean, it's, it's just amazing. So as we prepare to go to Mars, we have to consider what, what do we know from a psychological, behavioral side about living in hostile environments. So I'm going to walk through a little bit of evidence that we have um, from a few spaceflight studies and then some from what we call our ground analogs um, where we are able to conduct research in order to understand exploration missions. Um, so just one little snapshot from historical space missions. And this is a slide, actually several of these slides, it's, uh, our team works very closely together. So I want to give credit, this is uh, some work that Jason Schneiderman, who's our, one of our scientists in our group, um, pulled together for a presentation last year. And, and in his assessment, he uh, looked back at some of the historical space missions, including Soyuz missions, and we have instances in the past. So I do want to say that we completely um, uh, acknowledge and, and, and are uh, thrilled that our crews uh, succeed, our spaceflight missions are so successful and our crews do so well and um, thrive overall on these missions. Um, but given the context of exploration, that's where we feel like we need to ramp up. So that's where the, the research element comes in. Um, but additionally, there, are, there have been instances, um, nothing uh, mission, hugely mission impacting, however, um, on the US side at least, to where uh, some of these issues have arisen in the past. So we have a Soyuz uh, flight from 1984 uh, where a crew reported hallucinations to mission control. Um, another Soyuz flight in 85 where depression may have contributed to evacuation and early termination of a mission. Again, that's on the, on the Russian side. Um, but it is noted that two of uh, seven of the NASA shuttle Mir astronauts reported um, occurrences of depressive symptoms. So again, Mir being a um, very successful mission, but very different in how we do ISS today. But still something for us to look at um, and learn from. In thinking about the International Space Station, we know anecdotally that, um, again, crews come back. Um, they've really thrived. They've really done well. On the research side, we have some research studies to kind of dig a little bit deeper into that experience of living and working in space. Dr. Jack uh, Stuster of Anacapa Sciences has uh, completed an investigation where uh, crew members um, on ISS missions, there was a first iteration, he had uh, 10 total crew members on ISS complete journals during their stay. The study actually completed in um, 2010, but about a year later it was uh, kicked in again, and so he is now completing the second round of journals. Um, it'll be really interesting to look at the two different phases because the first uh, journal study included both four and six month mission um, ISS flyers and we also have pre the private crew quarters and then after the private crew quarters. And likewise, the second iteration will include six month um, crew members as well as um, um, our uh, one year um, astronaut and, and other uh, changes in some of the dynamics up on, on ISS. Um, and so what Dr. Stetzer did in when he collected all the journals data from crew members, he had previously conducted a journal study in the Antarctic and uh, worked with his team to do qualitative analysis. So what we're in looking across all these different journals uh, maintained by Antarctic expeditioners, what were some recurring themes that came up? And from there, he built a framework of looking just at keywords and, and topics that people tended to, to journal about. And his premise is that the more salient something is to you, the more you're going to write about it. So, um, of course, that takes into account, I and mean, we have to breathe, we have to drink water, and those are not typically the kinds of things that we're going to sit there and journal about. So, yes, those are very important aspects. But as far as what people think about and ruminate about and what is very salient to them, um, his premise is that they're, that's the kind of thing they're going to they're journal about. So he used the framework that he developed in the Antarctic and found, um, I think, had a group of close to 30 categories. 
And then whenever he collected data from the 10 ISS um, crew members and completed in 2010, he looked at those categories and he did frequency counts about how often are folks um, journaling relative to this category. So across the 30 some odd categories, he actually uh, plotted them here. And so what you see are frequency counts of these topics. And with work, not surprisingly, being the most commonly journaled topic, um, followed by outside communications, and then a category that he called adjustment. They also journaled about group interactions, recreation, equipment, events, things related to organizational management, sleep, and food. Those are the top 10. And for the rest of the journal's report, what Dr. Sester does is he digs more deeply into those top 10. And you can actually find, it's a fascinating document, you can go online and Google uh, Sester Astronaut Journals, and um, it's very interesting, and uh, lots of great information in there. We've had other research groups that have gone to journals um, because of just the wealth of knowledge that um, Dr. Sester was, was able to pull together. But in the remainder of his report, what he does then is he looks at each of the top 10 categories and digs deeper and does frequency counts within each of those categories. And I'll show you just a couple of those really quickly. Question. Yes. Are, are none of this uh, kids that are left their families? Is family embedded in one of those? Yes, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I think it's, we'll see it more come up in things like outside communication, maybe adjustment, where they do have comments about families. Another thing he does when he digs deeper into each of the the 10 categories, he does additional frequency counts, but then he pulls out quotes, and those quotes are really insightful, and so you'll see in there that there's comments related to, to family, but you're right, that's a great, great um, catch that there's no like actual family category. So in looking more closely at the adjustment um, category here, let's see if we have anything relative to family. Um, there's, yeah, I don't see anything, there's thoughts of home there, five uh, down. So basically um, what he looked at is relative to any difficulties adjusting that they might have journaled about or any, um, any uh, facilitation with adjusting, so the positive side of it as well, um, he counted that in here. So if they made a statement about being, the least commonly uh, noted when there is fatigue at the top. So if they made a comment about um, having a difficult time adjusting to the work pace or feeling fatigued um, because of the change, then he captured that in this adjustment category. Um, the, what you can see there is high morale at the very bottom. That's the one that was most commonly noted across the journals. And what he's done, the different color schemes, is he's looked at by quarter. Is there a difference? So you can see that high morale is journaled uh, about uh, uh, heavily across the mission, um, most heavily near the end, and also then at the beginning. And then we see there in the third quarter, there's a reduction in the amount that they journal about um, high morale. But if you go up a couple to low morale, you can see that low morale kind of increases in that third quarter. And that's something that researchers um, have brought up in the past is from a psychological perspective is there's this third quarter ph phenomenon where no matter how long your mission duration is, um, but particularly it's going to show up in a, in a longer uh, duration. But if you're talking a six-month mission or a year-and-a-half mission, um, some, have, some researchers have said that the third quarter of the way is going to be the most difficult because you've kind of passed that halfway point, but you still have a ways to go before you get to the end. So um, this is a uh, theory that even you know, looking at college students or anybody that's embarked on, uh, something that is a, uh, a finite um, mission, I guess you could say, um, that near that third quarter they start to feel a lull. And so if this is indeed the case, it would help us when we look ahead to Mars missions to say, okay, if we need to provide additional support to the crew, then maybe we need to tack on a few more things in that third mission, um, just because that's where the risk uh, lies. But not all researchers have found this, so it's still something that's being looked at more closely in, in our research studies. Um, so another ISS investigation that I wanted to bring up today, this was completed, um, data collection actually concluded in December of 2011. The publication came out last year. And so this was looking at 
um, average nightly sleep duration for both shuttle and ISS. And crew members during this investigation wore actigraphy devices and also kept a sleep log. So um, we had both objective and subjective data. Actually, this study was led by Dr. Charles Seisler, Laura Barger, and Aaron Flynn Evans um, over at Harvard Medical. Um, Dr. Flynn Evans actually is, is now over at uh, NASA Ames and works with our group um, as well. But what they found was that um, the average nightly sleep duration for both shuttle and ISS was right around six hours. There's about a 14 minute difference. So I think you had, um, or actually seven minute difference, just over six hours on ISS and just under six hours for shuttle. So this was a bit of a surprise years ago. I think um, some of us had sort of this mental model that shuttle was the sprint and ISS was the marathon um, and that it wasn't as um, taxing. But what we found is from a sleep perspective, there really was no significant difference in, in the average nightly sleep duration at that time. Um, we did see also reduced sleep prior to launch. And so some people have come along and said, well, this shows that if they're only sleeping, you know, right around six hours before they launch and then they're sleeping six hours in flight, um, that must mean astronauts need less sleep. So uh, it's possible, indeed possible, that astronauts are in that small percentage of the population that don't require as much sleep. Could be skewed where you have um, that more heavily. But we've heard from crew members that actually some actually do need closer to that eight, nine hours. And, um, and so we don't think that that's a really the best generalization to make with that finding. Because actually what we do see is upon return, there is about an hour increase in how much um, crew members slept. So what we think is going on is that during the pre-mission phase, as they're traveling back and forth to Russia and traveling overseas, and the training is very rigorous, that that is affecting their sleep, understandably. And so they're getting six hour, around six hours prior. Then around six hours in mission, probably a combination of things going on in mission. But when they return and the mission is behind them, we see this <coughs> average nightly sleep duration increase, <coughs> excuse me, to seven hours, which would suggest that there might have been a sleep debt that accrued. <coughs> Interestingly enough, um, when the researchers looked at <coughs> sleep medication use, um, because with the high tempo missions, um, and this was really only on shuttle that we had data relative to, related to sleep medications. Um, but looking at total sleep time when they were taking medications and not taking medications, there was no average, there was no um, significant uh, difference in their total sleep time. Look um, that the only change that we saw was that their time to fall asleep decreased when they took medications, but only by about eight minutes. So this called into question the, the usefulness of sleep meds on, on ISS. Are they really working as effectively in microgravity? We're not sure. Or is it that um, because of all the shifting, the schedule shifting that happened in those early um, ISS days, more so than, than now, that people were having to sleep at very adverse times and would have slept only four hours and the medications helped them get to six, kind of unknown. But it does uh, lend itself to more questions about the effectiveness of uh, medications. And um, what the, the most commonly taken medications in flight are uh, Zolpidem and Zaloplon, uh, which is Ambien and uh, Sonata. And, um, and so we're trying to get a little smarter about how we um, use meds and how we prescribe meds and the, also some of the, the pre-mission um, testing that goes on. But again, that finding with the, um, with the meds was really based on shuttle data um, because we didn't have the, the medication data from ISS at the time. And uh, crew members were also asked to cite uh, reasons that they felt that their sleep was reduced. Um, and so things like voids or getting up in the middle of the night to pee, uh, too much noise, feeling too hot, feeling just uncomfortable, mission duties, um, too cold, um, and so on. And so um, again, while we value um, the, this kind of feedback and it's very helpful, um, there may be other things though that are less salient um, to crew, such as is there something um, going on with their physiology in space that might be leading to uh, abrupt awakenings? Is our elevated levels of CO2 potentially um, causing some of the awakenings? So these are some of the fallen questions that, that we have. And then um, another study, so uh, this study isn't published on yet. This is from, led by Dr. David Dingis 
of University of Pennsylvania, and, uh, but he's presented on preliminary data before, so this is what I'm showing you today. Um, he, a crew members in his protocol completed what's called the psychomotor vigilance test, and it's a, a basically a reaction time test. And uh, crew members were taking it throughout the mission. They were also taking it before and after EVAs. And it's really to characterize um, um, vigilance and attention, um, which happen to be uh, cognitive processes that are mostly susceptible to uh, sleep loss and fatigue. So that's why we hear in the news, thankfully it's been a while, but air traffic controllers um, um, falling asleep, which is, it's very challenging to stay vigilant looking at a screen when you're working in the middle of your biological night. But the psychomotor vigilance test is a, is a tool meant to detect uh, those kinds of changes. In addition to the psychomotor vigilance test that crew members completed on orbit, they also completed a, a brief visual analog scale um, that rated um, things like fatigue, workload, and stress over the mission duration. Now, I want to show here what Dr. Dinges points out is that he saw a increase in stress ratings as the mission uh, with days in mission. So eight, so half of the crew members, however. Now, four didn't show this increase at all, and four actually showed reduced stress. But overall, the uh, predominant um, trend was upwards. Now, however, having said that, I do want to point out that what they're toggling is a visual analog scale that's set right in the middle to a 50. They don't see the number, it's just a line, and they use their mouse. So it's set in the middle. And um, the increase is from 35 uh, up to 50. So what you can see, you kind of have to take this with a grain of salt, right? So um, although you do see an increasing trend, um, it's not you know, a, a, a dire situation. Um, but it does bring to question if we have missions, a three-year mission, in a much more isolated and confined environment, you know, should we be worried about, should we be looking more closely at these kinds of trends? Um, one last point from the study is that uh, the astronauts with higher stress ratings during the missions were the ones who tended to um, have less sleep time. So understandably, uh, when we sleep less, we tend to feel the st stress gets to us more. But it's a vicious circle, too, since anxiety leads to sleep loss. All right, so just to look at analogs, and again, uh, this, this next slide is also the work of uh, Dr. Schneiderman, looking at, um, now when we think about, uh, spaceflight data is incredibly valuable to us. Uh, astronaut population, um, very, very uh, valuable information, and, and we do appreciate the information that we are able to collect on orbit. Um, given the differences, though, between ISS and where we're going with Mars, we also consider experiences in analog environments. So uh, Dr. Scheinemann looked at behavioral issues in Antarctic overwinters, and so this is where you have groups of scientists, and, um, uh, and these are oftentimes funded through other agencies or from other countries. You have groups of scientists or um, explorers who go spend time in Antarctica, sometimes up to a, a year, round a year, and um, they uh, winter over there. And what we found was uh, some of these incidence rates uh, from different um, investigations. So for instance, um, uh, one study from uh, a 1981 Antarctic mission had one evacuation due to depression out of a 12-person uh, Antarctic crew. Um, we also had a 12.5 percent meeting the diagnostic criteria for one or more disorders at McMurdo and South Pole stations, as reported by Palinkas in 2004. So um, I'm going to show you that uh, one more data uh, chart from from that. But that really these Antarctic missions represent uh, this again this isolated, confined, and extreme environment that is similar to what we would expect for a Mars mission. Um, there is some selection criteria, but um, they, the Antarctic crews normally don't go through the same rigor as an astronaut population. So again, not whereas with ISS, we have astronauts working real missions. We have some of the caveats around that they're very close to home. There's a great support system. Um, and when we look at Antarctica, very high fidelity in terms of the environment. But the crews there, we have to be careful because they don't go through the same rigor as um, astronaut crews. But uh, what we do see um, when we look at Antarctic missions is that, um, again, this increasing trend in, um, in 
I guess, a, a mental or, or a medical or a psychological diagnosis, uh, with insomnia being the primary thing reported. And this is from Dr. Christian Otto, um, who's a, a lead scientist now with um, VIP. He was with our group years ago for about a year. And what Dr. Otto found in his experience and some of the data analysis that he did later, uh, he saw, again, this third quarter trend that we saw from Dr. Stutzer, where you have an increase um, there. Now, he does point out that um, this third quarter happens also in the darkest phase. So is it the actual duration in the third quarter piece, or is it the fact that there's no sunlight uh, predominantly at this time? We, we're not sure, but we do see an increase there in things such as insomnia, adjustment disorder, counseling, anxiety, and depression. And just one last analog to pull on. This is the Mars 500 um, crew. Very cool photo that I, I'm assuming they photoshopped. <laughs> I don't think they had um, any way to have artificial gravity in there. But what this was was a mission um, back in, I think it concluded, I want to say 2011, 2012. Um, a crew of four individuals spent 520 days in a chamber over at the Russian, one of the uh, Russian space um, agency buildings and at the IBMP, um, and they simulated being on a Mars mission. Now, you could argue the wood paneling, um, gets, they get a lot of grief for that, but the, um, the volume of the, the platform, the, the day uh, schedule that these guys had, um, they, they really, um, you see the crew member pictures there posted on the side, they really had a um, high, high fidelity simulation. And what we saw in the Mars 520 day, um, there were two uh, studies from the Dingus and Basner team, two US studies, all other studies were investigators, uh, international investigators, I'm sorry. Um, what they found was that when they looked at their sleep and circadian rhythms, they found that four of the six crew members um, experienced either difficulties with sleep quality, uh, deficits in vigilance, they had uh, different, circa their circadian rhythms shifted, um, and that those who had the lowest sleep also had the most difficult with the cognitive, most difficulty with the cognitive tools. Now, that being said, overall, we saw an increasing trend in how much people slept. So another concern that came out of this study was, even though there were a few folks that couldn't sleep well, you had an increasing trend in the majority of the people in how much they slept, and uh, Dr. Dinges has mentioned that they actually moved less over the mission. So they had actigraphy devices that measured not only how much they were sleeping, but how much they were moving. So they looked at the movement data, and they saw that over the 520 days, they didn't move as much. He says that they actually even moved less in their sleep. Now, it turns out there was a Wii and an Xbox and things like that, and I think Part of it could be that as the as time went on, the crews were doing more and more of these activities um, inside of the inside of the habitat. But um, there was in his publication, he talks about the concern around um, um, just passivity, lack of motivation to exercise, lack of movement that could happen in a Mars mission. Um, they had another publication looking at more of the behavioral side. So they looked and they saw that. Um, they had one of the six crew members that reported depressive symptoms, and also um, some negative, three of the six had um, some changes as measured by the palms in things like uh, confusion, bewilderment, and other things that were looked at. Okay, so knowing all this, knowing all these potential issues that could arise, um, how are we gonna prepare for a Mars mission? So there's a few bullets here we're gonna start with. What our group is looking at is how can we make sure that we select resilient individuals? Well, we know now, we do really, NASA does a great job of that. We have crew members that are highly successful. We have mission controllers that are um, highly successful, high, highly uh, adept at working with the crew members and um, pulling off these incredibly successful missions. So a lot of what we aim to do is to understand what is NASA doing right and how can we add to that because of the additional stressors of a Mars mission. So we have, um, and I won't go through all this, but we have some investigations right now looking at biomarkers um, to see can, do, can we have these um, predictors of resiliency um, for future spaceflight. Can we know based on things like um, your profile with cortisol or heart rate, how you handle stress, um, can we know things uh, about you physio physiologically that could 
allow us to understand how you might manage stress in a future mission. So we have three investigators focusing on that aspect right now. And then we have, uh, again, this effort to understand what, what, how can we leverage off of what NASA's already done in providing recommendations for the future. And Dr. Larry Polinkas did a review uh, looking across um, all the literature in Antarctica, what were some of the psychosocial characteristics that rose to the top? And what were things that we would want to select for versus what can be trained for? So he came out with some uh, recommendations uh, along the lines of selection and brought up that individuals who are older, emotionally mature, highly motivated, socially adept, um, things that I think you know, a lot of us would, would uh, agree with, right, would make a good crew member. Um, uh, and, and folks who rely on social support to cope with stress are more likely to perform well, is what he saw in his review in, in, our, in Antarctica. And then um, he suggests that certain individual characteristics not normally associated with good performance may be particularly suited for success in an envi ice environment, such as being um, introverted, not par particularly conscientious or open to experience, low in emotional expressivity, having little interest in leisure activities, and needing little sympathy from others. Those might be characteristics that could also lead to somebody being highly successful. So, um, so our job now is to kind of understand what is the right mix of this? How can we um, really come up with that profile? Who's going to make the, that great Mars um, expeditioner? So Dr. Al Holland um, and Dr. Jamie Barrett and Brandon Vesey, um, Al is a... Uh, 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 psychologist that works on the operations side uh, along with Jamie Barrett and then Brandon Vesey is uh, one of the psychologists in our research group. They decided they were going to do kind of a job analysis looking at the competencies most needed for exploration. So they haven't published yet, I'll just give you a very high level view. Um, they worked with a total of 26 subject matter experts, um, primarily crew members. They also included folks from MOD and um, a few others, uh, I think a couple of flight surgeons, and they asked them to look across these um, different kinds of missions. So we have type A, B, C, and D. So we have um, near Earth orbit, short duration, uh, near Earth orbit, long duration, um, far from Earth, short duration, and then the Mars mission, far from Earth, long duration. And to categorize what are really the most needed um, behavioral competencies across these different missions. And uh, based on interviews that they did, um, they had these different candidate competencies rise to the top with adaptability, communication, and judgment um, really being um, the most critical uh, to rise to the surface based on their preliminary analysis. This is based on 50%. They're gonna be um, uh, publishing this down the road and we'll have a lot more information. But their, their goal is to really get closer into understanding what are those characteristics that's gonna make somebody be um, resilient, but also a successful team teammate. Um, and along the lines of teams, in preparing for Mars mission, we have to figure out not who is the right individual to select for such a mission, but once we have a group of individuals that we feel would be um, we feel would be ready, uh, how do we put together the right team of those individuals? So. Uh, a big a part of our research strategy is working here at NASA with the Human Exploration Research Analog. Many thanks to um, Daniel and Tiffany who are with the Flight Analogs Project and who make all this happen. But we have uh, been running studies in HERA and out in Building 220. If you've not seen it yet, I recommend um, you research it online and when they offer tours, uh, take them up on that. It's uh, very high fidelity to what we expect a uh, Mars habitat to look like. And we've had uh, various campaigns. We've had, um, oh, there's a typ typo there. But in 2014, there were four seven-day missions. We also completed uh, four 15, 14-day missions in 2015 and are now preparing for four 30-day missions coming up um, starting in January. And the focus of many of these investigations in the HERA has been evaluating things related to team dynamics. And so I won't go through all this um, in great detail, but for instance, Dr. Steve Kozlowski, he's looking at ways to understand how teams, uh, team dynamics over long duration. This is something that's really missing from the general literature. If you look up research on teams, um, a lot of times it's students coming into a lab and having a task to do over a few hours um, and then leaving. And 
what's really been missing in the literature is understanding teams in these kinds of environments for long periods of time. Um, how do they uh, evolve? Now, the military has done a lot of work in this context, and we're starting to work more and more with them, but there's still a general gap in the literature looking at teams. So Dr. Goslowski, he's trying to um, understand the dynamics of team cohesion in these kinds of environments and to uh, propose an unobtrusive measure instead of having questionnaires at the end to say, you know, how did you get along with everybody? How did you work? We, people don't, it's not, it's not a real ideal way, um, especially when you talk about astronauts who are busy doing mission tasks to have them fill out a survey. Um, it's just not a real ideal fit. You're not going to get very good data. So we're trying to develop, um, uh, sorry, unobtrusive measures, objective measures that can help us evaluate more of these team dynamics over time. So Dr. Kozlowski is looking at these sociometric batches, and what he's able to do that is to plot the physical proximity of people uh, over time and make some inferences about uh, the team dynamics accordingly. So he's looked at teams in Antarctica, and then again we have these HERA missions where he's done some testing, and he's also done some testing a, a little bit in NEMO. And uh, difficult to see here on the data, but he's found that, um, not surprisingly, co cohesion fluctuates um, within individuals and teams. And what you see here is uh, from the winter over teams that he's looked at. And um, positive affect buffers adverse effects of negative affect and low cohesion. Um, and then that this, from his preliminary data, he's looking to continue this, this benchmarking so that we can come up hopefully with a general profile of, of how teams evolve over a long duration mission and we can figure out how we can mitigate uh, more effectively for a Mars mission. And hopefully the sociometric badge will prove to be something useful. So another very important aspect is, um, okay, if we've got the right people, the right teams, we've got to have the right kind of habitat. And there's a lot of challenges um, that go along with this that are many uh, over my head, but you know, the propulsive performance constraints of mass and volume, so we can't take these beautiful uh, habitats up to Mars, unfortunately. So um, what's the kind of miniaturization of subsystems that we can take into account that we're going to expect before construction begins? What kinds of, and where we come in is we're trying to think about what are the countermeasures um, necessary to ensure safe um, uh, and physiologically and psychologically healthy astronauts. Um, a lot of things that come up sometimes is, okay, what about multifunctional reconfigurable spaces? Let's say we have a Mars vehicle, and um, to really optimize the space that we have, maybe what we can do, this has come up before, but the people have brought up the possibility of reconfiguring uh, crew quarters into a public space during the day and then closing it up um, at, at at night to allow people to have their own sleep space. And what we've learned is that when you start talking about a very extended mission, um, what we've seen in Antarctica is that uh, people's space becomes very, very important to them. And so even though it's a payoff from a space and volume perspective, it could really uh, become problematic. And so we've, we've um, gone to meetings before and really tried to discourage this approach when we start talking about long duration habitats. Um, and so, we like to have something like this. This is a snapshot from the Martian, right? Kind of looks, the hygiene module looks a lot like Hera, but anyway. Um, so part of what we've worked on is addressing the general question that came several years ago. How big should the spacecraft be? How much volume would the crew require? Because now we're talking about planning for a mission that is uh, longer than anything we've ever done and further than anything we've ever done. So we were asked to provide a minimum number of cubic meters uh, that would be needed to support a crew, like their psychological health, right, for exploration missions. So even if you do a task analysis and you look at, okay, how much task do you need for somebody to, let's say, go on the treadmill, you can come up with, um, the human factors folks are great at this, you know, they, they come up with how much space does one need to do a task. But you have to, you, it, it's, it's not, that's not the only thing we have to take in because you can't just put a treadmill right in front of somebody's, you know, workstation, right, or right in front of a wall. Um, you need to have sort of that psychological space. So those are the kinds of things that we have been working on in partnership with Human Factors. And about a year and a half ago, we had a uh, subject matter expert consensus session. So we pulled in five external experts 
um, to come and work with us and to look at that Mars DRM that we looked at early on to talk about what are the tasks that are going to be needed on an exploration mission, what's the minimum volume of these tasks, so again, that treadmill and how much space that we need, how can we co-locate tasks that make sense. So for instance, conducting medical evaluations in the private crew quarters. So kind of looking for affordances or, or ways that we could, um, efficiencies, ways we could leverage off of space where it makes sense. And then we kind of tried to roll it up and group um, similar tasks into six functional era areas. And then we mapped it out and came up with a proposed volume. So this is the work of Hugh Broughton. He was one of the um, experts on the consensus, consensus session panel. He actually designed Halley Station um, out in Antarctica. Uh, he, his group won uh, an award by the British government several years ago. And so um, their Halley Station, uh, they actually incorporated things like real cedar. And um, he mentioned that he has a rock climbing wall. In his proposed plan, he had a rock climbing wall as a recreational kind of a thing. And then they had a bar. And when they were awarded the contract, they were told, one of the things, changes we need you to make, though, is one of them's got to go. Because they, they didn't want to see the rock climbing wall with the bar. Um, so I think they tossed out the rock climbing wall, actually. <laughs> but, um, but so he did all this work. And now they have the Halley uh, stations out in Antarctica. They're really fascinating if you get a chance to look at them online. Um, but his team really took into account, they kind of went above and beyond a lot of their competitors when they put in proposal for that because they were trying to take into account not just functional space and cabins and a kitchen, but what could they do to the environment to really optimize the psychological health. So he came in, he worked with us, and then he plotted this out using his architectural software and know-how and came up with this um, theoretical layout of a uh, Mars habitat and also looked at it um, its specific section, so what he calls birthing section, uh, which is British for uh, crew quarters, I take it, but the sleep, sp sleep spaces, and then common areas, and then he allocated, um, he allocated volume, or we as a group allocated volume, uh, specific volume areas, and came up with a recommendation based on um, this assessment that um, a minimum acceptable net habitable volume space of 25 cubic meters per person. So uh, that was our recommendation from a psychological health point of view. Then we threw in a bunch of caveats <laughs> with that. So that we came up with this number based on a microgravity environment that allowed for more use of the space than, part, than um, uh, 1G. Uh, assumes, we assumed a crew of six. Um, so for instance, uh, you can't just uh, replicate based on a certain crew number because some things took into account group, group meeting spaces. Um, and we had things like acoustic isolation and privacy, you know, making sure that other things were in place. Um, and just to put this 25 cubic meters in perspective, um, based on previous vehicles, Skylab was 120 cubic from what we could find. So the problem in looking back at the other literature is that not everybody counts volume the same way. Somebody might have reported on habitable volume, others report net habitable volume. Net habitable volume takes into account things like um, removing, for instance, you know, the little bit of space there between uh, an appliance or, you know, a, a rack and the wall. Um, so it, it's hard to kind of pull all this together because there's different measures that have been used. But Skylab was um, 120 cubic meters per person. ISS is 85, um, with the crew quarters being 2.1. And then you go down to what we're proposing for Mars Habitat, or what we're recommending was 25 cubic meters per person. Um, with crew quarters uh, of 5.4. So what you'll note there is that we increased the individual quarters um, over doubling what is uh, in ISS now because we feel like given the extended mission duration that that's going to become very important. But at the same time, we did include a recommendation that there's a common area that accommodates all people at the same time. So it, it, it's not just a common area that can do three and you can switch around, but really a common area that brings everybody together. Because while we do want to, uh, we feel like promoting people's private space is important, we also don't want it to go to the other end of the spectrum where you have isolation and people withdrawing. So both, both sides are important. So we have plans um, to test uh, proposed volumes and layouts, hopefully, in some of these uh, different analogs. That blue and blue one right there at the very top, I think that's Halley. That's the one that Dr. Um, Broughton worked with, uh, the different Halley stations.
there's a, I think the red one is the common one that has uh, things like the kitchen and the bar, I guess. And part of testing um, different habitat layouts and, and looking at people in isolated confined environments in these more restricted spaces is looking is looking at the, the level of private space that they have towards their behavioral health as well the ki as the kinds of um, countermeasures that we can give. You know, there's questions around, well, can we send virtual windows instead of real windows? Because real windows are so much heavier. It's that much more lift. So uh, could, could a cam camera on the outside of the vehicle with some really nice screens inside, is that, will that replace that need to have a window to look out of? You know, and it's hard to say without having done the studies whether people would be satisfied with that. We're also looking at immersive um, virtual environments. So I'll show you that in just a minute. And so there's a lot of hab habitability related questions that we have to <laughs> answer uh, in route to Mars. And then um, one of the things that we look, we're looking especially carefully at related to habitat is lighting. So lighting is really important because it cues our circadian rhythms. So lighting is important from a, a visual performance point of view, an aesthetic point of view, but there is a biological response that we actually have to lighting. And, um, and basically lighting at the right time of the day cues our clock to that it's morning time. And then diminishing lighting in the evening cues our bodies that it's sleep time. So um, what's happening on orbit is they don't have the same kinds of cues. And you might remember at the beginning I showed you the sleep data is off. Um, their circadian rhythms can be misaligned. Part of that is, we think, related to the lack of lighting cues. So what, uh, what's important to remember is that our circadian pacemaker regulates. Uh, it's very important because things like core body temperature, when we release melatonin, uh, when we're awake, when we're sleepy, when we're performing well, it, it's very tied to our circadian clock. And um, there is evidence that shows for instance, that time of day relates to things like car crashes, heart attacks. Um, it's also, they've done analyses looking at the content, the negativity or positivity of Facebook and Twitter posts and found that there's a rhythm to those as well, a daily rhythm. Um, and the body clock is in the suprachiasmatic nucleus inside the hypothalamus in the brain and it regulates um, all these other clocks that we have in our bodies. So even down to our tissues and our cells, we have a clock. But it's all regulated by the master clock in our brain. And so that's why we have things like peeing at a certain time of day, getting hungry at a certain time of day. That is all tied to our circadian rhythms. And it's intrinsically regulated, but the external, there are external cues and most primarily lights that cue our circadian rhythms. So uh, what you can see here is showing that with the stimulus of light or darkness, we're going to tell our, it's telling our bodies certain things. And when we think about process S, which is sleep, and process C, which is circadian rhythms, these work hand in hand. And what you find is that there's the sweet spot for us to get optimal sleep. Whenever you are having to be awake at a time where you want to sleep, you're at an adverse risk for errors, um, mood issues, fatigue, accidents, and all sorts of things. So let me just skip. So one. So we recognize that lighting is going to be extremely important, and um, we recognize that it's very important also for ISS. So um, I guess I think a year from now, in October 2016, they're going to start um, installing new lights on the ISS, and these will have more of a day-night cycle to them. So right now, it's kind of a dim fluorescent, sort of like here. That's all they have on ISS. The program years ago was going to uh, start making um, plans to move towards replacing with an LED light. And standard off-the-shelf LED lights have like the opposite problem of fluorescence. Fluorescence are, are depleted of short wavelength, which we perceive as blue. And so there's no alertness cue. So fluorescence tend to be very yellowish and um, they have no boost. LEDs have inherently tend to have a blue peak to them because that's what powers them is this boost in the short wavelength light. And so what we were concerned about is, okay, now on ISS under fluorescence, there's no alerting cue. It's a constant dim fluorescent light. What they were talking about would have potentially led to a constant alerting effect. So, um, and if they're up in the middle of the night and you have nothing but blue enriched fluorescent um, LED lights, 
this could have caused issues as well. So what's really needed is a light system um, that promotes a short wavelength peak or a blue peak in the morning, kind of like we get when we drive to work, and in the evening suppresses the blue and gives us a more of a yellow and orange uh, light. So we're not cued at night. And um, we get this driving into work, driving home at night. Um, part you might, you might have seen in the news, there's more and more literature coming out with uh, people reporting difficulties in sleeping um, because of things like handheld, looking at handheld devices at night. Those are very blue enriched. Um, and so there's new technologies coming out, like lights for the home that you can regulate that can follow more of this day-night cycle. But we're hoping that um, these new lights on ISS will uh, provide more of a day-night cycle for the crews. And we're hoping that we'll get smarter, too, with how we do light systems for future Mars vehicles. From what I understand, just digging around and things that I could find at um, different assessments that researchers have done out at JPL, the uh, sky on Mars is less blue. Um, it's more of an orange, uh, just like, I guess, the planet. And, um, and so there's the potential there without smart lighting systems in the habitat themselves there's potential for um, circadian misalignment. There's also a difference in the day. So those of you, no spoilers, I promise, but in the Martian, um, they're counting Mars Sol uh, as opposed to, to what we call here an Earth Day. And the Mars Sol is, um, we have a 24-hour day here. They, at Mars, a, a day is 24 hours and 39 minutes. So adapting to that change in a whole day um, is, is going to take some some support from things like lighting systems. And um, so another thing we're looking at and preparing is how do we facilitate connection with home? So looking at the scene again from the Martian, we have here an Antarctic expeditioner also um, dealing with isolation from home. So crews on a Mars mission will be more isolated from loved ones on Earth than any other space traveler before. And we see here, you know, this Wonderful ability to look at our beautiful Earth, and um, it's going to be different when we go to Mars. So <laughs> part of what we're looking at to enable this is uh, mentioned uh, virtual worlds over to you. We have a team called Ansible. It's led by Peggy Wu. And they have um, a, a technology that they're working on that um, incorporates the use of these 3D worlds. Um, and I'll to see if this, sorry, unless the YouTube comes up really quickly. We don't have to watch the whole thing, but the premise is to, um, you know, astronauts of tomorrow, I know my kids, they love to play things like Minecraft and go in these virtual worlds and get lost in these, all these, all these different places. And this, this uh, technology from Ansible is sort of along those lines. It's, you know, can we provide this sense of um, space to crews you know, let me, sorry, clicking the wrong thing. The Ansible project demonstrates a okay. prototype virtual world that astronauts on long duration space flight missions can use as a psychological home away from home. Ansible provides activities that serve oh, it's not as coming ways up. to escape sorry. the confines I thought it was coming of the up. spacecraft. Is that even up there? Forms of interaction and okay. Intimate Never mind. We won't show the. Uh, hold on one second. Do this. It's essentially. Um, sorry, I didn't think that it would not. I couldn't um, display it, but it's essentially the ability to have these virtual worlds. But they they also have a different. Um, um, they have additional kinds of ideas and concepts. So let's say that the crew members on Mars, they have a 3D printer, and their child made you know, a clay object at school that day. You know, they can scan that, and then you can actually have the physical uh, uh, manifestation of, or model of that, of that clay object appear for the crew member um, on home, at home, sorry, on Mars. But again, um, how effective are things like virtual worlds at mitigating these feelings of isolation um, in a Mars-like exploration mission? And so the Ansible team has gone to the High Seas Analog, which is um, in Hawaii, but it's on a volcano in Hawaii, in a really harsh area, harsh part of Hawaii. And uh, we have a research study there. Um, 
And the intent of this research study was to really hone in on mission duration and how much of a factor that plays. So what uh, Kim uh, Binstead, who's the lead of this study from University of Hawaii, um, and this is a facility she's procured through uh, uh, you know, the university there. It's not a NASA facility or anything. But she had a team live in high seas for a four month period. And then they had another team live in high seas for an eight month period. And then now they're at the, about a couple months, maybe a month into the 12 month high seas uh, crew. And inside of there, we're, we have researchers who are collecting um, data and trying to look at uh, some of the different outcomes. And um, the Ansible team has put in their virtual world, their virtual technology, not with the 3D printer part yet, but to see how in this 12-month mission, um, if it's going to facilitate uh, connection to home. The crews who are inside of the high seas facility, they went through a pretty rigorous um, selection process also. So we really tried to, um, Dr. Ben said, really tried to make sure that um, that we could generalize you know, findings uh, from here as much as you can in more of a kind of a case study uh, scenario like this. But the habitat, um, as you can see, it's small, self-contained. Um, it's at 8,200 square feet uh, on top of the volcano. Um, accommodates six crew members, and the space is about 1,000 square feet that they have. Um, it's visually isolated with very little visible plant and animal life, so very Mars-like from that perspective. And then they're actually conducting field work while they're there. So they're simulating things like EVAs. This is a snapshot um, from uh, Dr. Binstead of the first floor. Looks a little better than the wood paneling, I think. And then we have the second floor. So those are the individual quarters. And then here's an aerial view there. And you can see they have you know, water tanks, solar arrays, um, generators, they have a weather station, and so forth. And then here's um, a snapshot, some of the EVA work that they do, some of the traverses that they go out on. So during um, the high seas mission, we're looking at things like the team cohesion, team performance, um, based on baseline measures that we took before the crews went in, you know, who comes out really uh, um, excited and having, you know, feeling like they just really thrived on the mission versus those who came out and um, had struggled? Is there a consistent um, um, characteristic uh, across those individuals? Um, but we're hoping that this high seas mission will help us understand more about a Mars-like mission and some of the more psychological aspects and, and, and team-like aspects. And then the last thing is um, that I wanted to bring up today, and we're, there's a lot more going on in the research portfolio, but I just wanted to pull on a few main ones, is kind of understanding um, What's happening? Is there something happening cognitively um, on ISS in isolated and confined environments? Um, and if so, how can we mitigate these for a Mars mission? So um, depending on the research study and the anecdotal evidence that you look at, um, there, there are some reports of kind of space fog, these feelings of um, being cognitively off, Probably a lot of that's just a general adaptation to the spaceflight area, but we do have a research study that is on ISS that's looking more than just at the vigilance and attention I told you about. There's some te a more e extensive cognitive battery, um, and we're also looking in um, different uh, analog environments as well. And not just the cognitive changes, but are there actual neurostructural changes happening? And that's the work of Dr. Rebecca, I'm sorry, Rachel Seidler, and um, her study is. Uh, kind of done in partnership between us and the human health and countermeasures element in HRP. And um, she is looking at, uh, she's doing functional MRI before, before ISS missions and on return, and looking at any changes in brain structure, function, um, network integrity, you know, prior to the mission and after. She's also uh, looking at this in um, bed rest uh, participants as well. To sort of tease out, you know, what is really um, a space flight component? And I believe in the bed rest one, there's also a control group. So what is just the course of time, general stress versus more of a microgravity change uh, versus something unique to the ISS is what her work is trying to really hone in on. Um, and while they're in mission, they're also completing um, different cognitive uh, tests. 
And then Dr. Basner, um, he has deployed his cognitive assessments in various um, Antarctic stations and um, is also doing pre and post um, fMRI as well as uh, extensive cognitive batteries. So this will help us to, again, hone in what, what is, is there a unique spaceflight stressor or is it things that um, just are inherent with high tempo workload, being you know, isolated and confined from home for a while? And this is going to be, and this is, a, a, again, work from the slides from Jason Schneiderman. Um, this is going to be especially important because of the potential changes that we face with radiation on an exploration mission. Um, there'll be increased um, deep space uh, radiation, and uh, what we know from rodents is that when they're exposed to these kinds of radiation um, exposures, they will show cognitive decline. Now, Dr. Davis and Dr. Hines are looking at things like individual differences, because what they are finding is that in a group of rodents, some are more effective and others seem to be resilient. So there seems to be individual susceptibilities, um, even to something like radiation exposure. And they've also been looking at potential countermeasures. Um, Dr. Davis did an assessment looking at flaxseed and found um, some promise there in terms of it being a, a, a mitigation strategy. But we're concerned about cognition, not just in the context of of uh, current space flight, but it's going to become ex um, increasingly important, again, because of the added stress, the confinement, the duration, but also when you pull in other stressors in a Mars mission, such as um, radiation. So that's, that's it. And this is something that Dr. Lauren Levitin pulled when uh, she gave a presentation at ASMA. She's our element scientist. She pulled from this um, beautiful uh, National Geographic uh, publication that came out in like 1976, and it had this, uh, Isaac Asimov did a, a, a visual of these future Mars habitats, and um, I thought that was really clever of her, but I think we're a long ways from certainly that shopping mall look, but uh, maybe maybe down the road, you know, we'll start um, being able to, to really have um, sustained life systems on orbit and, and support our crews, and um, hopefully not just on the physiological side, but the behavioral side as well. So thank you all for your time today. I really appreciate you listening to the kind of the evidence and what sort of what we're uh, founding our uh, future work on and, and what's coming up in our research plan. So thanks. Are there any questions? Okay. Thank you. Sorry, I know that was a lot of information. Yeah, that's a great question. So we kind of look at ourselves as two sides of the same coin. So they, we're interested in a lot of the same things. So they want to understand cognitive changes, responses to high workload, responses to fatigue. But what they, they need that information because, for, and I don't want to speak for them, but my understanding in working with them um, is their purview is more, okay, how are they going to adapt the tasks, the displays, the procedures, the environments? Um, so we're kind of on the human side and looking at how we can enable the, the human to, to, to work through the stress, and then we provide our information, and then they take it, and they optimize the environment. So we work really closely with them because of the, the overlaps. It's a great question. Thank you. Thank you again. Appreciate it. Thanks very much. I will. I'll let her know. Yeah. And as I said, the next class that we have, uh, we're going to be putting the um, information into Saturn uh, concerns the media class that will be held not here in this side of building two, but over in the PAO side of building two. And that's November 12th. November 12th. And so by the end of this